and welcome to the first episode of Konzo's RPG Review. Um, today I've decided, if you can't tell by the background that I've added, we are going to talk about our first RPG, and that is Earthdawn 4th Edition. Cool little chroma problems going on. Check that out. Um, and we're going to test this out. I'm going to talk to you about it. Um, this book has been... I should say this game has been something that I've been playing for, oh my god, 20 plus years. Uh, just recently, they have gone to a new edition, uh, which is a new fourth edition. You can tell by the background. Um, and a lot has stayed the same, but they've made some very good changes to the game that is definitely needed. Um, but before we get into that detail, uh, let's talk about this game was made and is made by a company called Fossa, which is not the Fossa of old. It is a new company. Um, they have started um, this company and it was done by on Kickstarter. So it was easy to get into the campaign and uh, well worth the money. Um, I bought into it. I really, really like uh, Earthon. Um, and so they decided to... How can I say it? Keep the story the same, but change some of the mechanics. Um, Earthon, if you don't know, is of course a fantasy world. Uh, but there are different things to this world than your typical fantasy. Um, you have your typical uh, races, which is your elves, dwarfs, humans. Um, you also have orcs. You also have uh, obsidian, which are kind of like rock guys is the best way to put it. You also have uh, a few other ones that are different. I um, can't remember if I said elf or not. Um, you have what's called a Tuskrang, which is a lizard man, per se. Um, you also have what is uh, trolls, but the trolls is like the bridge under the water trolls um, with the tusks, kind of like big beefy orcs. Um, other, class, other races... Uh, what was the other one that I missed? Um, let's see, I got the cinnamon, orcs, um, trolls, Tuskrang, and windlings. Uh, windlings are kind of like pixies or fairies, but much larger. Um, you also have... How can I put this? You have classes in this game, but classes different and vary. Um, from what you're, what people are kind of used to. Typically, whenever you're playing in a D&D &D campaign or wherever you can go, oh, you can't, in character, you can't say, hey, I'm a third level warrior or I'm a 50th level warrior. In this game, you can because your abilities and your class system is actually your way of life. And so you have to get things done that way. Um, so... You get your varying classes. You have things that are called air sailors. You have um, sword masters, blacksmiths, uh, troubadours, three different kind of spellcasters, nethermancers, illusionists, wizards. Um, oh, so there's another one. There's a couple of them. Um, you also have a beast master. Um, you also have, and they're called. They're not called classes. They're called disciplines. Um, you have, um, let's see, let's see, there's Air Sailor, I should have wrote all these down, Archer, Beastmaster, Calvaryman, which is, of course, right in them, around. Elementalists, Illusionists, Nethermancers, Scout, Sky Raider, which is kind of like a, um, hang on a bit. Boats in the system also fly in the air, so that gives you a hint. Uh, Swordmaster, kind of self-explanatory. Thief, kind of explanatory. Uh, Troubadour, bard, for you like to play bards. Uh, warriors, uh, weaponsmith, wizard, and nethermancers. Did they take those out of this one? No, they couldn't have. Um... No, there it is. Okay, I'm making sure. Got a little scared. Um, and so in the game system, you, when you're playing, um, your class is your way of life. 
not just, hey, I'm a warrior and I beat things up. Um, the thing about this system is that it really pushes people to role play their characters. Um, and to do that, they've incorporated a really cool system. Um, what they've done is they've taken um, your group and your group is supposed to be a very tight and really knit group. And what you do is you write down your journeys. Um, I've run this game, I've run this game twice. And in each time I've run it, uh, my players have recorded their game sessions like on their phone or uh, some other type of uh, recording device. And the players record their session, uh, write down in a journal from their character's perspective, uh, and usually have one person in the party do this, and write down, hey, we killed this, we did this, you know, this is what happened. And um, every so often they can turn this report into the Dwarven City. Uh, and there's a game mechanic that you can figure out, and it's up to the up to the storyteller how they're going to uh, do this. But for every certain amount of things they do, they get um, experience points, which are called legend points in this. And they also get um, uh, money based on certain things that have happened in the game. Uh, and the reason they do this is because of how the story is in this game. Um, if you've played previous editions of Earth Dawn... Um, it's pretty much the same. If you haven't played any editions, this is going to be some new information for you. Um, Earthdawn is a world that at one point was a high fantasy, high magic um, type world that uh, magic was thrown around a lot. Every character in the game has some form of, ma some form of magic use. Um, and the problem was that they were doing this and they were casting magic so willy-nilly that it brought down these creatures called horrors uh, from the astral plane and these creatures that came down just started wrecking havoc all over the world uh, destroying uh, everything going crazy and what happened is the entire population decided to go underground um, when they went underground they built these cairns and they stayed there for a long time um, after all these horror creatures destroyed the world. Um, and so the world is pretty much coming out of these uh, cairns and coming out back into the world and trying to survive again. So it's kind of an open area. Um, there's a lot of places that are around um, that they want to know. That's the reason why the Dwarven Capital will pay a lot of money and uh, experience for people bringing in stories about the world because it's new. Um, it's something different. Uh, they want to know if things have changed, what's happened. Um, and so your leaders, your group, I should say, uh, goes around and figures out uh, what happened to the world and see what's going on. Um, some of the things that are different um, in this world is spellcasting. Spellcasting is really different. Um, you have kind of two ways of doing this. You can choose to just cast out of a matrix and cast kind of like a wild magic where you just pull the essence out of the air and throw the spell. Um, and that's kind of what happened and led to the destruction of the world to begin with. Um, you can still do it, but when you do that, you kind of alert your, uh, or you can alert creatures that are the horrors in your area and around astral space that you're there and pull the trigger towards you. Um, or you can cast them with your own matrixes and that's the safe way to cast them, but it takes a lot more energy and a lot more time. Um, other systems, other things they have is there's no healing class in this game, which I think is a really good, uh, thing that they've done. Um, and the reason why is because everybody else can heal themselves to begin with. Um, everybody has an ability that lets them have recovery dice and after a fight you can heal yourself. Um, you can, um, some classes can heal themselves during combat. Um, there's also, um, healing yourself after the combat is the common way. Um, but there's certain things that, and there's a reason why there is no healer class and it's part of the story. Um, and there's a lot of source books that you can get that aren't fourth edition, but it will help you get whatever you need to from the first edition. Um, so nobody's regulated to just sit in the back and throw healing spells. 
Um, certain classes, like I said, certain classes can do it in the middle of combat. Most people can have to do it after. Um, another good system I like between this is magic items. Magic items aren't just, oh, here's your plus one sword, or here's your, you know, your holy avenger. Um, you've got your typical standard magic items, which are, you know, here's your healing potion, or here's an armor that provides a little bit more protection, uh, stuff like that. But, um, what everybody has is eventually everybody gets the ability called thread weaving. Uh, spellcasters get that to begin with. Um, other people get, uh, get it later on during their adventure because of their leveling up. Um, and what thread weaving does is lets you attach part of your body into an item or a potion or a weapon, or you can actually thread weave into other people. You can actually com complete, um, a group ritual pattern and you can thread into the pattern to help yourself become better. Um, so it's, it really focuses on creating a story. Um, you've got simple ones that you, all you need is to cast and put one thread into something and you can up your spell casting ability, or, you know, you can, uh, you know, throw a spell through a wand or have a spell stored, or you can thread weave in the, in your armor. Um, but then there's other magic items that are really, 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 really cool to thread into um, that have different steps that you can go through that, you know, you start off and you get, oh, this, this weapon does a little bit better damage than uh, a normal weapon and then it increases so much. Um, but you have some that are pretty much, I would consider like artifact level when they are able to get um, a bit higher and when you do it, you have to perform deeds with it, uh, kill a certain creature. Um, I know one of them I remember uh, from playing it a long time ago with a bow, and you had to give the bow back to your uh, enemy. You had to give your bow to your enemy, and they had to keep it for a certain amount of time and then return it back to you. And you did that. It was a great deed. You gained a lot of experience, uh, legend points, and then you also uh, got that level and it increased even more. Um, so that was a really, really cool aspect I liked about it. Um, so, I mean, thread weaving, when you're a spellcaster, you start off a little bit more powerful, but you really can't take the damage. Um, but the, uh, warrior definitely and other things that are really, really cool like that can, um, soak it up. Um, so, I mean, that was something I really liked was the magic system. And also your storyteller can have, you know, your basic item turn magical uh, by creating different steps and things that go along with it. Um, another really good system between this is uh, levels, aka circles, mean something in the game. You can technically go up to someone and ask them, hey, what circle, you know, archer are you? And they can say, I am, you know, a 12th circle archer. And they go, okay. And, uh, because it's also about learning, um, because when you level up per se, you have to find someone to train you and you got to pay them, pay them or perform certain rituals and get it for free. No big deal. Um, some people pass it, pass it over. Um, I don't remember if this system included the ghost trainer or not, but there is certain ways. Um, the uh, other thing that you can do is um, whenever you're training for different levels, you accrue new abilities. Um, there's not a, hey, I've got um, different, uh, I, I, I reach a certain level of XP, that means I automatically level out. Um, you actually use your legend points to increase your abilities, which when you get certain abilities up to a certain level and a certain amount, uh, that'll let you increase, you can get abilities from the next circle level. Um, which plays a really big part in the game. Um, when they talk about Earth Dawn and it's creating your legend, that's what you're doing. You're building the legend of your character, which is really cool. Um, the story system, uh, putting characters into danger, all that stuff is really, really important, uh, in the system. Uh, recording it is really important. Um, and there's a reason why I really like this. I've run this twice. And each time I've run this, the campaign has lasted over a year each time or more. And that was playing two, one or two times a month easily uh, for, you know, five, six hours at a time. Um, 
So I really highly recommend this. I, I want to give it a little bit of detail when we talk about the characters, uh, the races. Uh, humans, which is your standard type human, um, they have an ability that makes them unique called versatility, which lets them take talents, which are abilities um, from other classes. So they may not be able to, um, if they chose a human thief, the thief would be able to use some abilities from another class which is really cool. Uh, so it lets them branch out and have a little things. It takes a lot of experience to keep them and make them really cool like that, but it, it's something worth talking about. Um, elves, um, elves are the nimble class and uh, are able to have a little bit better movement speeds. Um, windlings, which are the fairy folk, of course they can fly. Um, they're very, uh, Energetic is the best way to put them. Uh, very happy all the time type. Uh, if you see a sad windling, something's wrong. Uh, dwarfs, uh, a little bit sturdier than everybody else. Um, what else? Uh, let's see. Tiskring, which are kind of river swashbucklers is the best way to put it. Uh, very flashy, usually a lot of sword masters. Um, then there's um, Nethermancer, or not Nethermancer, that's what I'm talking about. Obsidian. Uh, instead of being a rock people, uh, they actually come from the planet. Um, they don't breed like normal. Um, they're slow in action, um, but they definitely are experts in whatever they do because they spend a lot of time thinking it. Um, think the tree ants from Lord of the Ring, the ants. Um, so they they are, they're pretty good. Um, orcs orcs are uh, the were the slave race, and they have no place to live around right now. So they're trying to find their place in the world, um, and so they can they're pretty hardy. Um, trolls, which is your you know big tusks, uh, honor bound, uh, strong types. Um, they're really um, really good. If you like an honorable type of creature, they. Uh, are uh, kind of always serious for the most part. Uh, so there's like this animosity between them and windlings, which is kind of fun. Um, something else uh, about the races is um, you have two names. You have a name that you tell everybody and your true name that you get when you're at the naming ritual or when you're born, depending on your race. Uh, you never give out your true name to anybody uh, because if you give your true name out to somebody, uh, people can weave magic to that pattern and use it to control you. Um, that might sound a little confusing, but everything in this world has a pattern um, and it's an astral type symbol. Um, they give a really good example in the book, but it goes into a lot, a lot of detail and you know, your pattern starts off small when you're born and then all of a sudden it branches out of all the histories that you've done and people can see it um, that have the ability to see astral sight and can see what happened and can weave part of whatever they want into that. Um, which is a really cool concept uh, behind everything. Um, there are some, you've got your standard enemies uh, that you're used to um, in any fantasy world, but the ones that really stand out are not only um, your standard basic monsters, you have a kingdom um, that is a pretty technologically advanced but a slave uh, kingdom. Uh, I'm not going to give you the name of it because I kind of want, in case your GM wants to pull this out, he may flip you and turn you into that kingdom instead, instead of doing this one. Um, but the main big horrible bad guy in this is um, the horrors. Horrors are creatures that love to cause people pain because they feed off of it. That's how they survive. Uh, they don't want to kill for the most part they don't want to kill you um or you've got the lower lesser ones that definitely will um you got one that's called a nasher that's just legs feet and a huge mouth that will kill you and eat you for breakfast all the time uh, and, and they're the big baddies in the game um horrors uh, the lesser ones you can see out and about cadaver men stuff like that um they um, how about this? they're out there and you don't like seeing them because they're scary. Uh, they can kick your butt quite quickly. Um, 
but they're so low that when you see them and you fight them, eventually you're like, okay, this doesn't matter until you start getting into larger ones and uh, worm skulls and all these other things that just really wreck the world up with it. I mean, they kick your butt um, because spells are really, really powerful in the game. Um, then you also have uh, the named ones, which are actually physically named. Um, and when I mean they named, they are not just cadaver men. They're like uh, the eyeless one. Um, uh, there's like a whole book and they have physical names because they're unique and they're one of a kind. And these are ones that will try to find you, take you, and corrupt you and make you evil because it suits them and makes them happy. Uh, they will take and just destroy your family um, in the most bizarre, nasty, disgusting kind of ways. Um, work in the background. Um, do everything they can to make your life miserable because they live and feed off of it. Um, they can be a major, major plot history. Uh, they could be the entire story of your campaign. Um, they can involve everything, but you've got to be careful not to use them um, willy-nilly because they're supposed to be the embodiment of all that is evil. When I mean all that is evil, it is their, some of the things that they can do and some of the abilities that they talk about and how they act and react. It's just plain disgusting. It's You've got to be... As a GM, you've got to go, these guys are horrible. Um, you also, what you can see up here in the corner is dragons. Dragons actually play a very integral part in the game. Uh, they play a lot of politics, which is quite cool. I like, um, they're very smart. Uh, dragons um, are pretty dying off in the world. So they influence the world through other people. Um, which is really, really cool. Um, so you'll have emissaries and dragons are no freaking joke in this game. Um, whenever they do damage or like a breath weapon, it's not a flame and it just goes and it hits and does damage. It's like napalm. It goes, it hits and lays down on everything. So even if you get hit by the fire breath, it'll lay on you and burn through you. Um, they're highly intelligent, uh, super powerful, very big spell casters. You you don't want to touch or do anything with them. You want to be on their good side um, and always bring a gift anytime you see one or meet one. Um, but you typically don't see and meet them. You get invited or you've done something to push their um, buttons to influence what's going on in your world. Um, combat in this game is once you get used to it, um, it flows really smoothly. Um, it's an initiative-based one. Uh, your initiative is based on your stats and your gear, uh, and you roll a dice. Um, one of the things the system has an exploding dice system, so when you roll a max of it, you get to roll again. Um, so it really pushes. Um, you can get really high up, and you do have abilities that um, some classes or some circles and disciplines, when you get certain circles, will give you an ability that lets you get a... Um, initiative increased ability um so it's it's pretty interesting because you roll your dice um and then after you roll your dice you go and you do uh your initiative step and you start from highest to lowest and you say what you're going to do after you say what you're going to do then you initiate what you're going to do because something may change uh, in that process so if you have a group of five you start at the top uh bad guys depending on what they are if it's a group of like you know cadaver men you just roll for the group you don't roll for individuals um, but whenever you're playing and you're doing combat, you say what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, uh, with whatever ability is, so I'm going to attack with my melee weapon. Um, you roll the dice and you roll to hit, um, your weapons and all your abilities are based on a step, which is where it's ranked at. Um, and then you add your step, um, attribute, and then it gives you your that and you have a chart in the back and this is where it kind of gets a little different um in the book because you have to figure out what your um step is and whenever you look at it if i can find it real quick i had it marked and i lost the mark 
um, you can figure out what you need and how you need to roll um, because this uses every type of dice system um, every type of dice I should say it's not just d6s it's d4s through d20s um, so I can find it real quick oh I just passed it and so I'll show you a quick picture of it. It's maybe hard to see. Oh, I'm just going to go out because of the chroma key. Um, so it has a system. I'll link a few things in uh, in the Facebook whenever we get uh, whenever I post this of different things. But like if you have a step one, it's like D four minus two to every action that you do. Which yeah, it's you're not going to really go far or do much with that but eventually you can get up high enough where you know it's quick and easy um you'll learn the steps and everything pretty um fast um and of course you'll have a copy of it so it's not that big of a deal uh, but you roll to hit and then you roll the damage um the thing is is when you're rolling to hit you're trying to hit on someone's defensive stat and so when you hit on someone's defensive stat if you get that number higher you hit them um and when you're or you roll above it um and you hit them and then you roll for damage and then there's a chart for the damage uh based on the same steps um and depending on how well you roll either the armor counts or the armor doesn't count except for in this edition which i'm glad they changed um because one of the issues with one of the last edition is if you were a big plate wearing warrior your defensive stat was really low because you couldn't move around a lot, so you would get hit a lot. But your armor wouldn't count for much because you got armor defeating hits. So whenever you attack somebody and you roll over a certain amount, you got armor defeating hits and the damage would just go directly to your body. Um, now with this addition, instead of it going directly to your body, you just get bonus damage on top of it. Uh, bonus steps. So when you get an armor defeating hit, you get bonus steps to do damage. Um, so it's like a critical hit. Um, and so while you're playing and you're doing everything and you've got it going on, you roll and you do the damage. Uh, you apply the damage to your character. Uh, if you have armor that and you didn't get an armor defeating hit, you subtract it off. So if you got a 10 and you do 20 points of damage, you take 10 points of damage effectively. Uh, but you also count and look at your stat. And if you take a wound, um, because everybody has a wound characteristic, and that's when you take a really hard and heavy hit damage, um, if you take a wound, you have to roll on this check to see if you get knocked down or whatever. And if you take too many wounds, it drops your steps down in your abilities. So you're getting hurt more. Um, the more hurt you are, are the worse, you, uh, worse your abilities and everything work. Um, because you have two ratings on your hit points. You have a uh, unconscious rating and a death rating. When you hit your unconscious rating, you just go unconscious and lay on the ground and bleed out or whatever. Uh, when you hit your death rating, you're just dead. Um, there's not much you can and can't do. Uh, when you hit that death rating, there's a couple of items that can help you, but there's nothing like per se or like resurrection. Um, when you pass away, you pass away. Um, so combat can be pretty deadly, pretty quickly. Uh, so working together as a team is a very big must. Um, combining abilities, because there's some abilities that say, hey, if your partner is here, you can do this and distract and help out. Um, there are buffing, like the Troubadour is very good. Uh, another thing I forgot to tell about uh, magic items. Um, whenever you're playing with uh, magic items and such, and when you pick them up, you just don't automatically can use them. You have to take those items and research them um, and figure out about them. And when, it's the reason why you like to have a troubadour, because they can do this quite easily. And they don't have to go to a library. They can just study the patterns and figure out what's going on with them. Um, but they... Um, they figure out key knowledges and when you find out the key knowledges you can go up in so much ranks and when you get to that certain rank you can figure it out and then they've got to do another check and test it out and look um it's actually really cool um so magic items mean something in the game you just don't go buy the super powerful one or whatever 
Um, but there are certain ones that are available on the market. Um, another thing I like about the system is there's really no true gods in the game. Uh, they're called passions. Um, and there's good ones, and then there's mad ones. Uh, mad ones have been corrupted by the horrors. Good ones are pretty much, I wouldn't say they're good, but they're, they're not corrupted by horrors. Um, and they actually walk around on the planet. And you have ability, you have people that are called questers, and the questers um, do things in that name of their passions. And, of course, it can get their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Get their uh, eye, I guess you could say, and they can bestow powers on the people that are following along with what they're doing. Uh, questers aren't gods, so they don't see everything, know everything, do everything. They are just super powerful beings that uh, participate in the world. Like I said, there are some that are called mad passions, and those are ones that have been corrupted. Um, I like um, Earthon a lot because they give, um, and, and you can get the, the core books. Um, you can get them PDF, online. Uh, I bought the books whenever I did the Kickstarter because I like books. I'm uh, more of a book person than a PDF. Uh, I've run, like I said, I've run two successful, really good long campaigns that have lost, you know, a year or more on each. Um, it's a really good story game. Um, has a lot of good information. Um, there, if the fourth edition doesn't have a lot of books out, they've only got like two or three, I think I got four books out right now. Uh, but you could find all the old edition stuff um, online. Uh, probably like on eBay uh, from the original series and I would go with first edition. I wouldn't go with the living room games and there was one other one uh, for background material and it's like it's like 20 plus books and you can get a lot of good information uh, a lot of good stories um, a lot of good plot stuff um, and there's other disciplines uh, out there than the ones that are in the basic book um, I don't know if they've converted them over yet um, because there's been uh, ones that are like the horror stalker, which is someone that actively goes out and finds horrors, which is, you know, you kind of get scared when you see that in your campaign. Or someone wants to play one because that means they're actively looking to go out and kill them. Um, and then there's different types of magic. Uh, you also have what's called blood magic because um, blood is very powerful. Items uh, and it fuels bond between people. Um... Other than that, uh, I highly recommend it. It's my number one. If anybody says they want to play a fantasy world game, I'm like, this one's the one we got to try. Because um, it's got everything I like. Um, Story-wise, combat-wise, you name it. Um, every single one of them I've played, I've started my role, my characters, uh, my players out as they are actually in a cairn. And they're coming out of it for the first time. And so it provides an easy way to get a party together it provides an easy way for them to be already a team um and they're coming out to the world and it's all brand new so they can they don't the, you won't have to use any meta knowledge to let them figure out stuff you can just let them figure it out because they don't know and neither do their characters um so they get to figure out a bunch of different things um there's some mass combat rules um, if you like dungeon crawling, there is a super city dungeon-esque type thing to go through. Um, and I'll let your GM or whatever figure that out. And it's super, super cool and super, super deadly. Um, this world is not all happy-go-lucky. There's a lot of very sad and evil things that have happened to it. Um because everybody had to protect themselves. Um, because anytime, um, like it says, horrors would cause pain to people so they could feed and live and do stuff. Uh, there's a race of elves, uh, they're called blood elves, that uh, in their place they live, Thornwood, they cause damage to themselves and pain to themselves for the rest of their life so they wouldn't get attacked by the horrors. Um, I'll leave that up for let y'all know about it and give it a teaser. Um, like I said, really good on role playing. Combat systems are really good. They've uh, took out some kinks that I didn't like in fourth edition. Uh, and the weaponsmith, um, 
has gotten better. Uh, the Troubadour got better. Um, and those are the two classes I thought that were the kind of issues in the game. Um, they took out the combat of um, armor defeating hits immediately go through armor, which really, really helps out even um, because it was kind of stinky to have all this armor and you constantly got armor defeating hits on you. So you were kind of SOL because uh, especially if you roll the max on a die, you get to roll again. Um, some people and um, like to cap that at a certain time. Um, the one thing that I did and I house ruled it is I didn't like illusionists in my game because some people have a hard time going, oh, that can't be real and metagaming out the illusion factor, which is it's, it's understandable. But I took them out of the game um, just to make it easy, but you could do it no problem. It wouldn't be an issue, uh, especially someone new and you got a new group. Um, I'm really, really liking this. I've actually, um, when I went to Gen Con a couple of years, uh, the books just came out. And so I got to play uh, with the designers, uh, one of the guys running it. And, um, and it was uh, uh, Josh Harrison, excuse me. Um, he ran a game for us when we were at Gen Con and he was really nice, really cool. Um, every time I've seen and talked to them, the group, they've been really awesome. Um, uh, Josh ran one of our campaigns. Uh, he didn't got my, signed my copy, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, and so I highly recommend that. And there's a ton, like I said, there's a ton of things out there. Tons of character sheets, uh, homemade character sheets, you name it. Um, so I highly recommend checking them out. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can email me, send me a link on YouTube, uh, Facebook, you name it, uh, and I'll help you out with it. Um, if you have any questions about the system, let me know. Um, it's one of my favorite, and it's one of my favorite worlds of all time. Um, other than that, uh, thanks for listening. If you could, make sure you do a follow down below, subscribe to us. Uh, if you're interested, you can check out our Patreon page and uh, help us out. Uh, if not, we'll be on Twitch uh, streaming live again on our podcast on January 7th, where you can definitely hear Kathy rap Wild Wild West um, on it, thanks to one of our patrons. Um, other than that, I appreciate everything you do, and thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>